Hey, it's Coach Taylor from SmarterTeamTraining.com. I, I got to let everybody know on the show before we get started. Uh, the first time that I did this interview with Stu Singer, um, the, for some reason it didn't record. And I told him afterwards, I, I wrote an email, I felt very bad. And he fired back saying, let's do this the first opportunity that we can. He, got, he made a, a commitment on his own end to say, whenever you're available, let's do this. Uh, so I have to say, that speaks incredibly high about the passion this man has for helping others uh, achieve their own greatness. So, uh, Mr. Singer, man, I appreciate you getting on the phone with me here. And uh, I'm looking forward to an outstanding conversation with you, my man. Thanks, Rob. Looking forward to it, absolutely. To, get, to let everybody know on the phone here, uh, Stu and I talked uh, a fair amount before this show, this episode uh, even started. So I know I have a, a ton of questions, and I know this guy has a, a boatload of energy. Uh, if anybody's interested, go to uh, wellperformancecoach.com. You can get to his bio. You can get to his website. We're going to post his bio as well here on the description of the show too. But I'll just give you a heads up and a little bit of a uh, you know lead to if you want to just you know do a little background, a little bit of history on him uh, as well during the show here. Um, Stu, before we get started, man, if everybody's getting a chance to read your bio and, and what you did in 2000 kind of thing, I, I want to know a bit about you as a person, man. As, as far as the passionate person you are, I've heard you speak and present. Obviously, I've had an opportunity to listen to you talk a couple times now uh, to me on the phone personally. And I want to know about the passionate person you are, man. How did you become involved in this field? And, and tell me a little bit about what you got going on now, man. Yeah, I definitely came to this by, um, you know, by by passion. There's no two ways about it. As a, as a young athlete, um, my my high school coach had given us some information on on sports psychology and and for whatever reason it it clicked and, and also he gave us the opportunity to uh, to coach uh, younger athletes in our in in our school district um, as, as we were in high school as high school players and between those two things just kind of realizing the power of the of the mind in performance and then realizing how much I really loved coaching. It became something that uh, that became a vision for me, young, and um, and it stayed with me. Um, I coached. I, I got my master's degree in counseling. Was a uh, was worked in the school systems as a coach and as a counselor, and just kept uh, kept at it. And and over time, what my decision was was I wanted to uh, go back and get my doctorate uh, in in sports psychology and um, and become a, a full time sports psychologist and. And that's what I did, um, and and I always say that uh, every single day I'm doing absolutely what I love to do. So uh, I'm very fortunate to to be here. I've had the opportunity to work in the college environment for a long time. I know you get an opportunity to work in, in the college, the collegiate environment. And now that I'm getting a chance to learn more about the youth model and some of the things that people are going through to prove themselves. Uh, I, I sometimes I don't know if I'm concerned or, or, or interested. I mean, can you walk me through the process of, uh, you know, what are young athletes going through when they're when they're trying to feel the need to prove themselves on a team to a coach or even potentially to other to their parents for that matter? I mean, can you walk me through that process? Is that a positive experience, a negative experience, or or how can I help the, help the athlete uh, just work their way through that? So what you're talking about is definitely something that is um, extremely common, and and the reality is is that you know if at some point when we decide we want to play sports at a competitive level, whether that be you know even as a as a high schooler um, at the you know kind of club or AAU level of whatever sport. Um, you know, we, but we really decide we, we're, we're willing to, to put ourselves on the line and play where, where we can get cut from teams or we might not start or we might not get a lot of playing time or what have you. And then certainly as we progress to the, to the you know, collegiate or, or professional ranks, the, the, there should be that drive that you want to prove yourselves. And, and that, there's, that's, that within itself is not a bad thing. What I try to do, though, often with athletes, is help them to understand what it truly means to prove yourself. So each time you move up, um, whether that means that you are a middle school athlete and now you're going to become a high school athlete or a high school athlete that wants to become uh, a college athlete or even a, a, a JV high school athlete that wants to become a varsity athlete, each time that you you know kind of grade up, you you are back down to the bottom of the totem pole. Even if you are a fantastic player, you you kind of can can go down and and in the fact that you just can't possibly know everything you can't be prepared for everything because you haven't gone through it yet and so instead of trying to prove yourself by being perfect which is what a lot of athletes get into their mind somehow that i need to prove myself as in i can't make a mistake i can't miss a shot i can't turn the ball over 
Um, you know, I, I want to, you know, get stops every time. I don't want to get beat. And what happens is, is that that's an impossibility. And because it's an impossibility, doubt begins to creep in. And once doubt creeps in, fear of failure is not far behind. And once athletes fear that, feel that fear, they begin to uh, see that, um, that they're, they start to play to not make a mistake instead of to make a play. They, they begin to play not to lose instead of playing to win. And that small hesitation uh, or small holding back is enough to, to make them not the best that they can personally be. And so I try to reframe it for them, for them to understand that the way you prove yourself early, um, when you're first kind of stepping up in, in whatever grouping that you're in, is that change it from perfection to progress. So I'll say progress over perfection. Make progress. And the way that we make progress is, is that we listen first. We really show that we're willing to listen and take feedback, that we're not going to get upset if someone tells us, uh, corrects us. No matter how good we were, we, we have more to learn. And so be willing to listen. Be willing to learn then from what we just listened to. And then be willing to work and, and do what it takes. And if you can do that, I promise you that you will make progress. And once you start making progress uh, for, for, the, for the teammates that, that you're trying to prove something to, that proves something to them right there. For the coaches that you're trying to prove something to, that proves enough to them. But at the same time, you become comfortable while you're doing that. And the more comfortable you become, uh, the more consistent you become, and then with that consistency breeds confidence. And so there's a real system. It's not just it's not just uh, I need to you know positive self talk or 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 I I need to ignore my mistakes. No, it's a willingness to listen because the more you listen, the more you learn, the more you work. You're going to get all those things. You're going to make progress, and and, and you're going to start to prove yourself that way. Every successful team that I think I've been a part of, I think you can wrap up the concept the, the one word for them would be confident and that's including the players from from the trust that they've established between players uh, and also the, the trust that's, that's established between coaches to coach and coaches to players themselves i mean is there a strategy that i could use to ensure that my teams are consistent with their confidence pre-game at practices even after games and you and i have talked about the day after games might be one of the most important days uh, to actually bring guys together or bring the team together or bring the ladies together and just talk about what uh, how they feel or what they're what they're going through uh, after competing. I mean, can you do me a little favor and just walk me through that strategy that you would use uh, just to to embrace the confidence that's needed to be successful? There are definitely multi levels to it, but I can tell you a few that I definitely try to to focus on um, from a, from the athlete perspective first I can say and then also I can talk a little bit about what I recommend for coaches to to do in you know in, when they're creating the environment for their athletes so first what I what I consistently do with almost every athlete that I work with is have them create their best self image and that best self image is, is tell me about the times that you know you're playing well, that you feel confident, that you feel comfortable, that you see things, that the court or the game or the field or whatever that you're on begins to maybe slow down just a bit and, and you just feel that comfort. And that is confidence. And so what are those things? And we get maybe three to five what I call, you know, would just call bullet points, whether it's just one word or just a, a short phrase. I'm talkative and communicate, communicative. I'm, uh, I have high energy. I'm attacking. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm positive with my teammates. My shoulders and head and eyes are always up. I never let my, my shoulders slump. Whatever it is that they, that they know about themselves when they're at their best, we, we try to create that vision. And the reason that we create that vision is because you're on a nonstop um, uh, relentless commitment to that path. That's, that's what we create. So you you score your first, you know, you, you make your first three, four shots in a row. We don't change. You miss your first three or four shots in a row. We don't change that. That vision continues to be exactly what we're trying to do because 
the only thing that you have, no matter good or bad that day, is that you know is what makes you your best. So you can never leave that vision of you when you're at your best. Anything else will allow for that doubt to start to creep in. And so, and, and that what if question, what if tonight's not my night, maybe I should stop shooting. Well, the second you, you buy into that is all of a sudden your body changes, um, your mentality changes. And so we can't begin to buy into that. So it's a relentless commitment to that vision that we ask for. The second part of that, though, is that you notice that everything I said is within the, the athlete's control. No matter how poorly you're playing, you can always be vocal and communicating with your teammates. No matter how poorly you're playing, you can always bring energy. No matter how poorly you're playing, you can always keep your shoulders and eyes and head up, even, even when things aren't going well. And so we make sure that whatever those goals are, um, that they are what we call process-driven. They're the process of success instead of outcome. So, for instance, I have an athlete that I work with, uh, University of Maryland, who, you know, we want to make sure that she's a nonstop rebounder. That, that's a big thing for her is to be relentless on the boards. And so instead of saying we want five, you know, rebounds per game or ten rebounds per game and create a goal that's not within her control, um, instead, what we try to do is say, what does it take to be a relentless rebounder? Well, you have to have a relentless commitment. You have to work on your positioning. Um, you have to, every time the ball goes up, making sure that you're making contact and, and, and using your body to, to box out. Those habits will result in outcomes. And if you can commit to those habits, you'll find success. But what we don't do is, is use the number because that number, if we don't hit it, creates a lack of confidence because like well what happened I didn't I didn't you know I didn't hit my number so I that means I played a poor game potentially you did everything exactly right the ball just didn't bounce your way um, so we can't be we can't build our confidence from statistics we have to build our confidence from what we do to make ourselves successful as often as we possibly can so that's from the the player perspective one of the things that we try or a couple of things that we try to do from the coach's perspective, and you and I talked a little bit about this earlier, is I ask all the time to, to create a vision for your team of what you want. Instead of pointing out what they're not, point out what you want them to be and allow them to see where they're headed instead of what you don't want them to do. Um, I use a phrase called, you know, that I say that whatever you pay attention to is what grows. And so if you pay attention um, to your yard, your yard will grow nice and green. If you don't, it, it won't. So, you know, if you pay attention to the things you want your athletes to do and you give them a, a vision of that, they'll start, that will be what grows. If you pay attention and say, you know what, we can't shoot, we can't shoot, we can't shoot, all they will see and feel and hear is that we can't shoot. And so that's the vision that they're going to have. So as a coach, a quick reminder is, Figure out what it is that you want your players to do and, and create that vision for them, and, and most likely they're going to work towards that instead of trying to fall away from something that they don't want. Anytime you talk to a sports psychology guy, someone's going to ask a question about mental toughness, and I know you and I had this conversation on the first episode that we did it, and I thought it was outstanding. Uh, so the listeners, uh, please do me a favor. Start taking notes. Uh, is, is it possible to become mentally tough? And if so, how do I become mentally tough or how do I improve mental toughness? And if not, uh, how do we develop that in, into our system to really enhance that aspect of our game? My feeling is, is that just like um, every, you know, every, every year you'll get a, you know, a, 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 especially at the collegiate level, you get a new incoming freshman class. And within that class, you're going to have players who are just athletically gifted. And then you'll have other athletes who are, they're they're talented, but they're not they're not that next level athletically talented. But regardless, we're going to start to work with them with the strength and conditioning, and we're doing that in order to enhance their their athletic ability. So you take, you know, that that freshman who can just is a, can sprint, you know, unbelievably quick, can t change directions, can jump, and and you're still going to work with them though. You're still going to say, how can we you know continue to enhance that? Then you take the athlete who doesn't have the, you know, just can do things, but not to the level of that, you know, really genetically gifted athlete. 
but you're still going to work with them too. And you're still going to do all those same things to help them enhance whatever it is that they have. And I feel that that's the exact same thing that I do with the athletes that I work with. I'm just trying to enhance whatever they come to me with. So <clears throat> I may have some athletes that that come to me, and they are pretty secure. They are pretty pretty solid. That does not mean that we can't figure out their their next level. What's their next level? What's the thing that does challenge them? And let's try to try to figure it out because that's going to enhance what they have. The athlete that comes to me and says, you know what, I'm, I have this, this, and this, but I, I will admit, you know, I can be up and down with my confidence. We're going to work with that and try to enhance that as well. And so from a mental toughness standpoint, the way I really will go about defining mental toughness is, is simply that once we make a mistake, once we have, a, you know, whether it's an individual mistake, whether it's a team that has a bad loss, is how long do we stay in that? Do we allow one negative to become two negatives? And I use uh, an acronym sometimes called RACE, uh, Response After Critical Error. And, and what I ask is that, is that we try to build our response. So error is inevitable in sport. And you can do it as a team, like I said, at the team level, a bad loss as a group or a difficult loss as a group or individually either a bad game or just a bad stretch within that game, and how do we respond to it. <clears throat> and one of the pieces is is understanding that we have the ability to choose once we make mistakes. So we can either begin to dwell on that, start to tell our story about tonight's not my night, tonight's not our night, or we can get back to, as we talked about earlier, our, our collective best self, and we can say to ourselves that I'm not going to allow for one error or one day to to turn into two errors or two bad days. And and the more that we can control that, the more mentally tough that we are. The other piece to that is that you know if, one of the things that athletes need to understand is is that failure, the term failure. Um, we often try to avoid completely. We try to avoid this concept completely. And for me, the only time we truly fail is is when we quit. Everything else is simply part of of the process to get towards success. And and so I'm using failure in quotes at the moment because we need to accept the entirety of 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 competition. And the entirety of competition includes the highest of highs, but it also includes the lowest of lows. And so you'll have these games and these moments and these seasons that are just fabulous, best thing that you could experience. But you'll also have these moments that are some of the most difficult that you'll ever go through. And in understanding that when we signed up, when we committed to playing, we understood that both of those are going to be part of the experience. And we're not going to play in fear of the failure happening. Um, we're going to want success more than we're going to fear failure. And, and once athletes kind of learn to accept the fact that that's part of it, and guess what? I'm strong enough to handle it. There are going to be these down days, and I'm strong enough to handle it. Many times what I, you know, what I'll kind of, when I'm working with the athletes individually, is that they don't believe they are strong enough at first to handle it. I, I want to avoid it at all costs because the what if, what if that happens and I'm not strong enough. And once they start to understand that the concept of we, we sign up for the entirety of comp competing, they start to understand that that is inevitable, that we'll have those times. But the truly mentally tough are the ones who accept that, accept the pain for a little bit, um, but then they're, they're back to it the next day, getting right back to the things that are the habits and behaviors of success. If they can do that, they will stay mentally tough. They, will, they, won't, they won't peak at the great moments, and they won't you know, go down into the valley at the difficult moments. They'll stay pretty, pretty consistent, and, and that, to me, is mental toughness. I want to talk to you about one topic, again, that comes up. Anytime you talk about sports psychology, and I'll probably be yell that if, if someone's listening to this show and then I don't bring it up. So uh, I know you have a, a really good uh, response to the concept of being in the zone. I mean, what is being in the zone to you? 
how do I get my athletes in there if I can? Uh, are there some things that I should do or be looking for to add my practice to really enhance that opportunity? Or is it something that's completely bogus and we don't even know how to get into it? I mean, walk me through a little bit of that process as far as, uh, you know, the question, how do you get into the zone? How do you be in the zone? And how do we identify when people are in the zone? I think that our profession, my profession, has not done itself a service because there was a point where you would see a lot of, um, you know, whether it be books or DVDs or, or lectures on the concept of being in the zone and, and that we could get athletes into the zone. And I think that's a disservice. If If we truly knew how to do that, we would have athletes that every single night were were perfect. And we know um, that that's not the case. And, and there's really, and one of the reasons is, is because there are too many variables. There are too many things that are outside of our control for, in order to be, to be perfect uh, or to be close to what we would call perfect in a, in a game. So, you know, it, one of them could be weather. One of them could be uh, uh, conditions of the court or the field. One of them could be, um, how we felt that day, were we a little bit under the weather, uh, you know, family-related issues. There are just a, a multitude, uh, you know, could go on and on of variables that are out of our control. And so to suggest that we could put athletes into the zone where just everything that they see and feel is perfect is, to me, not reasonable and not realistic. Saying that, what I think that we can do is work towards the habits and behaviors that produce success. And we can do those and we can commit to those over and over and over. And we can see them, we can feel them, um, we can practice them, we can, uh, um, when we lose some, you know, either a game or, we, or, or we're not playing particularly well, we can call them up and use those to, to base our confidence from. So, for me, one of the things that I always try to do is to tell athletes we have to build our confidence from the inside going out. So many uh, athletes build their confidence from the outside going in. And what I mean by that is uh, coaches uh, are, are praising me, you know, telling me or, or just naming me a starter or, or telling me we're going to run the offense through me or uh, I had a great practice today or I had a great game. Parents telling you that you played well, friends, teammates. And, and that's all well and good, and certainly those things feel good. There's no reason, and certainly every coach, parent, teammate should always tell their, you know, their, their athlete, their child, uh, to their teammate to, that they played well. Nothing wrong with those things. But if that's the only way that we can build our confidence, that we can feel confident, then the downside of that is on the nights where things don't work, then we lose our confidence, and we need another good game another good performance to bring us back out of that. And and what we lose sight on are all those variables that I just mentioned before, all those things that are out of our control that lead sometimes to not the greatest outcomes. And so what we want to try to do is get the athlete in the idea of what's the process of my success. For teams, so for a coach, what's our process for success? Recently, just this week, I did a training for for a team that was going into a high school playoffs and and we talked about okay you've learned who you are now through the season who are you at your at your best and the team went through their the things that make them as good as they can be and we created that vision and we said that's our committed vision throughout the playoffs until we're bounced out or until we hold up the trophy that's our vision no matter what we're up a couple goals we're, we we stick to it we're down a couple goals we still stick to it. And that is how we create consistency. When I think about the zone, I think of someone really being as comfortable as they possibly can be out on the field, out on the court. And that's what it feels like, where things start to slow down, where things you know, feel comfortable and, and you feel good about how your body's moving and it feels right. And that is that's the zone, and the only way we can do that is through habits and behaviors that lead to success. But guess what? Some nights it's just, you know, there's too many other variables that might get in the way. Um, but, but that's how we try to do it as often as we possibly can. I want to talk to you about the unfortunate situation if a mistake uh, occurs. Uh, how does an athlete keep their composure? I mean, do you have a strategy 
for helping an athlete, and I'll even expand this a little bit. I normally ask a question about specifically the athlete, but more and more you also recognize that the coach needs to maintain their own integrity or their own composure as well. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, let's, let's attack this from two aspects too. Is there a strategy for helping an athlete or a coach keep their composure after making a mistake? That gets back a little bit to that concept of the, you know, the, the response after critical error. The goal is, is off, so let me take, uh, let me, let me backtrack. The reason that sometimes we, we, we become prone to a second error after that first is because we allow that thought to linger, that vision to linger. And, and when it lingers, we also start to talk in, you know, our own head. So for, let's say, a soccer player, I'm sorry, a basketball player who turns the ball over, they turn the ball over. That error within itself lasts maybe a second. How long we allow that one second to turn into 30 seconds, to turn into a minute? Do we turn the ball over and then come down uh, or hang our head and get beat getting back, and now that turns into a layup? Or do we, because we're, we're disappointed from that turnover, uh, do we come back and make another mistake on the defensive end and maybe get a dumb foul? That's what we're looking to to correct. So instead of allowing for that vision to get to creep into our mind, that 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 negative vision, um, we we again for my athletes that I work with, I'm always asking them to be relentless on their best self. They must be relentless towards that best self. That vision is always going to be there. So when that mistake happens. The second part is to understand that immediately when we make a mistake, we are going to feel emotion, and that emotion is probably going to be negative. And, but to allow for that moment of negative to happen, so we have that moment, whether it be you know, a, a slap of the thighs, a, you know, a, a close my eyes, whatever it needs to be, and then we need to get right back to the things that we know make us successful. And so you can never, what I talk about all the time is asking yourself that question, is what I'm doing right now helping or hurting? And if it's helping, we want to repeat it. If it's hurting, we need to minimize it or get rid of it. And so often I'll ask the athlete, if you right now, if, if someone, if all your thoughts were going to go up onto the scoreboard so everybody in the gym could see it, what would they see? And if they see somebody beating themselves up, I promise you that you're not going to be helping yourself. There's no way we can sit there and yell at ourselves, tell her, you know, we're not good enough. That was, how did I make that mistake? That was so dumb. We're going to lose the game because of all those things will never help you become as good as you can be. And so we have to work on minimizing those things. But the reality is, is very few times do athletes actually understand what they tell themselves in their, they don't realize they do it and they don't realize that they're hurting themselves. I'll do a, a little thing with them where, where I ask them, do they have a best friend? And, yeah, I have a best friend. And, and okay, it, after you make a mistake, what are the things that you say to yourself? Um, okay, now that they say those things, would you say that to your best friend? No, I would never say it to my best friend. Why not? Well, it would hurt them. It wouldn't, would, and I ask, well, would it help them? Would, would, would telling them that they're no good and they just made a mistake to lose a game, would that ever help them? No. And then I kind of just look at them and say, so why are you willing to do that to yourself? And it's that realization that, wow, I do things that actually hurt me, uh, that don't help. And once they can kind of see those things clearly, they become aware of them and they slowly but surely start to take control of them and create new habits. And that's how we create new mental habits for them. Stu, I know you're making a big-time impact on the individuals that you get a chance to talk, whether it's at the college sector and the private sector, getting a chance to speak at events. And I know you're trying to do more and more things as well to increase, increase the, the, uh, the impact that you can make on others. I mean, if someone had an opportunity to listen to you talk, whether it was in the huddle or at an event, I mean, is there one big motivational message or inspirational type theme that you would want them to take with them? The biggest thing that, that athletes can get themselves caught up in is, is either uh, the, thinking about things in the past. So I had a bad game when this happened. Oh, my God, is this going to happen again? Or I'm not, I, I'm not you know, shooting well. I'm not handling the ball well. I'm, you know, I, and and pr starting to predict the future. And when we get caught either trying to, to think about the past 
or predict the future, we, we have lost control of the moment, first of all. And, and second of all, because we don't control those things, we create, it creates a little bit of anxiousness within, within us. So probably the greatest thing that I can ask athletes to do is to be present in the moment, being able to see the things that I'm in control of right now. And the biggest thing that you're always in control of is, is your energy level, your, your, your ability to communicate and talk, and, and your willingness to, to not allow one mistake to, to turn into another. So if I could give any kind of, you know, the one piece would be always to stay really in the moment of what you can, and, and be really aware of what you control in that moment, because that's the only thing that's really going to impact the next play. I'm going to speak on Stuart's uh, behalf here, if you wouldn't mind, Stu. Uh, he's been an incredible resource here. Again, I've only talked to him a couple times on the phone. We went back and forth several times on email. I've actually seen him present and be in his environment. Uh, if you're a coach out there, you need to reach out to this guy, whether it's uh, an opportunity on, on the website, shoot him an email, uh, getting a chance to just connect with him when he's at an event or even in your, in your town, depending on what he has going on. Uh, I think he's a very good resource. So, uh, Stu, man, I really commend you for trying to make an impact on others. Uh, I know that you have a lot of things coming down the pipeline here, and uh, I'm going to obviously wish you a lot of success, man. Uh, if anybody wanted to reach out to you to find out more information about what you have going on, how they can reach out to you, is it to, to learn from you, to maybe implement some of these techniques into their team? I mean, how can they go about reaching out to you? There are three easiest ways to reach out to me. One would just be through right through my website. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, but I'll repeat it, which is uh, www.wellperformancecoach.com. Um, also through my email, which is ssinger at wellperformancecoach.com or uh, at my, uh, and follow me on Twitter at, at wellperformance. I'll give everybody a heads up. Uh, when I send uh, Stu here an email, he responds almost instantly. I mean, within an hour, uh, I'm getting a response from him, whether it's on uh, Twitter or, or through the, uh, the website or obviously through the email type scenario. Uh, I'll even send him a text or give him a phone call. And, and if he cannot answer right away, he's been very professional about getting back. And I have reached out to many professionals in the field and in various aspects of the field. And I feel that that's one lost uh, aspect of our professionalism. And, uh, and I'll give him kudos, man. I really appreciate that you, uh, you get back to me in a timely manner, my man. And, and uh, I know that you would do that for somebody else who, uh, who reached out to you as well. Uh, so, Stu, man, I, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day. I apologize for this being the second attempt on the show here, uh, but I, I think this episode was even better, my man. You shared a ton of great content. I took a boatload of notes. As you know, I go over with you afterwards, and uh, I'm sure that this is a launching pad for us to do many, many more things down the road, my man. All right. Loved it, Rob. Appreciate the opportunity.